Well, hello guys. It is like, well, it feels like forever since I had my guy sitting over in front of me on the other hell, <laughs> on the other uh, end here on the internet. Uh, it is Revive to Stage, Revive Stronger podcast with me, Pascal Floor, and my buddy Steve Hall on the other end. Checking in. Oh, Steve. And yeah, again, man, it feels like forever that we've talked. I know there has been a time in between where you were at a wedding, exactly. Oh, yeah. And uh, then we recorded the episode with Luke as well. So we didn't get the chance to interview me or you. Um, the last episode with me was simply a pre-recorded episode. Yeah. Yeah, full disclosure, right? <laughs> um, and this time, it's finally the time again in which I will interview my man, Steve, about the past weeks. And there is a lot we need to talk about. We didn't really have any plans, though. Uh, like particular things we want to touch on, but I know we are so extremely creative and highly intelligent <laughs> that we probably come up with some interesting topics to talk about. Um, but yeah, Steve, so you are now six weeks into dieting. Um, you participated at a wedding. You went out see a baby driver the movie yesterday at a cinema um so it sounds like you're not really into a contest prep mode but you are four weeks out now uh, three weeks no two weeks in terms of your uh, peak week um and perhaps if you like you could give the audience and me especially <laughs> an overview what has happened in the past weeks is there anything you want to touch on in terms of nutrition, training, the whole contest prep in general, what went well, what didn't went well, all the kind of struggles? Yeah, so, um, no, yeah, it does feel like quite a while. And it's really yeah. strange because whenever I get interviewed, I'm kind of like, eh, what, what do people want to hear? And it, it's actually really nice for me. Recently, I've been getting some messages where people are like, how have you done this? Like, what is your secret? <laughs> why is your contest prep seemingly perfect like what's <laughs> what are you doing i was like i'm not hiding anything i'm telling you guys everything i've been doing every step of the way there is no secrets but i think the overriding thing is like people are watching me on my instagram stories a lot of the time and they're kind of like you don't seem like you're dieting you don't seem like you're in prep like you're what's up like um like you said um i had but i think the last time we checked in was like before my deload. Um, so that was, I've just finished my first week of training. So yeah, deloaded. And then I had the wedding in which we can go over as well. So in that deload, typically during my deloads, I will bring nutrients up to maintenance. So rather than doing that this time, because my weight hadn't really gone in the direction we thought it should, um, and I had progress that I wanted to make more of, and I was getting closer to stage. So as you get closer to stage, kind of your thoughts are, yes, you want to retain lean tissue, but the most important thing is conditioning at this stage. Like conditioning is very important. So I took a bit of a less aggressive deload and diet break. So typically I'll deload heavily. So vo training volumes like halved, cardio's cut in half, and I'll increase nutrient intake as well via carbohydrates for the most part. But this time I just kept nutrients level and dropped loads of training and uh, went to one time per week training. So my step count came down as well. And this I timed perfectly for a wedding on the weekend um, where Charlotte was maid of honor. I went down on the Thursday night. So I was there Thursday night, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, all of those days away from home, five weeks out, uh, which is, for a lot of people who are five weeks out probably sounds quite stressful and it really could have been um but because i'm in a healthy state i think i dealt with it pretty damn well like it wasn't overly stressful i was able to help out at the wedding i was able to participate at the wedding i was able to dance on the dance floor um and ride the ball and ride, no, ride the ride the surfboard right? uh, there was a, a surf what's it called surf generator uh, i forget <laughs> yeah, what they're called no idea. like a surfing board that you could go in like it was outdoors got it was horrible though because the wedding was 
pouring with rain <laughs> it was torrential and like the dance floor was almost getting flooded there was mud everywhere um but yeah it was just like i was at the wedding i didn't drink alcohol um i like i just i could have probably put some into my macros really would have set me back so didn't drink alcohol just like drank on diet drinks had chewing gum had a protein bar with me um, I knew already there was a barbecue on that day, so I knew there'd be some chicken. So I just <laughs> skipped the sausages, skipped the burgers, had the lean chicken, had a burger bun. Didn't have any of like the snacky starters. So there was like cheese, crackers, um, like fatty ham and spreads. <clears throat> and then there was obviously loads of dessert. And the only thing I did allow myself is to have a small amount um, of chocolate cake that Charlotte had made because she made the wedding cake. So I wanted to try that because I'd helped her make it a little bit, didn't really do anything at all. She did an amazing job. It looked fantastic and it tasted insane, like <laughs> insane. Like I'm talking, I could have eaten like huge amounts of that cake, but I restricted myself. I just ate a small amount. Um, they had some how, apples on how, the day. <laughs> how are you able to do that? Yeah, it's... Made. <laughs> I managed to control myself. I'm quite good. It's something I know I know myself. So like for you, Pascal, it probably would have made sense for you just to say, no, I'm not having that. But for me, it I mean, was like... I, I, I haven't had a cake since I was 14. So oh. I don't even know how it tastes anymore. Well, I'm so not I, that I, big on cake. No, neither am fast. I. And I mean, in terms of overeating, I, I don't really have a problem with overeating ah. except for protein bars. Ah, well, that's good. Um, but yeah, it was amazing. I'm not that big on cake, but this was like wedding cakes are just amazing. I don't know if it's partly like they just put extra care into it and it's just, it's just fantastic, but it was really good. Um, so yeah, I was dancing on the dance floor. It was a long day. So I was up at like seven in the morning all the way through, didn't get to bed till like 2 a.m. So just kept going. And the, the only thing I found was, I don't, I don't think I was particularly lacking on energy. Um, it was slightly harder because it wasn't like my wedding or, or my wedding, but it wasn't one, like my friend or anything. So I was a bit kind of, I'm a, a quite socially isolating person anyway. So I'm not that social. So that angle was a bit harder, but it was fine. Like I was still speaking to people. Um, and then, yeah, got home to the, the room and just crashed. Um, the next few days were a bit harder. So I was quite tired. Like the next day I was particularly like tired, hungry, um, but still stuck to my macros both days. Had to do obviously some estimating when I was away, um, but nothing nothing much. Um, just made sure to go to supermarkets, keep myself full with like cooked chicken, lean meats, like lean protein sources, salads, lots of vegetables. Took some protein bars with me, some protein powder, and I was okay. So then after the deload, and I think we spoke about this, we expected my weight to come down. So this was kind of like, yeah, there was accumulation of stress, um, some of the maybe a bit of delayed fat loss going on, um, kind of waiting for that whoosh to come through that La McDonald talks about where fat cells don't release kind of their, their fat and water, they kind of hold onto it and then it comes off. And it did. So I actual Monday, wait, actually I have my weigh-ins for this week on my phone, which I think are quite interesting. So got back on the Monday and actually I was 169.25. So nothing, it was still like around 170, which I'd been holding for all the weeks prior. And then the next day on the Tuesday <laughs> dropped all the way down to 166.75, which is a huge drop um, to, from 170, like maintaining that. And I was like, nice. And I could see it in my physique as well. Like my quads were coming out more, my the rear of my glutes are starting to come through. Um, just looking drier overall. And it was funny because it kind of coincided on on that uh, Monday night, I completely shaved. Um, so like forearm hair, all my leg hair, under actually underarm hair, yeah, underarm hair, chest hair, all of that had come off. I was like, oh, I haven't lost four pounds of like just hair. <laughs> it doesn't weigh that much. Uh, but then my, the next day, my weight <laughs> creeped up to 167.25 and then up to 168, 168. It's been sitting at 168 like the last three days. And then this morning had a new low at 166.125. So it just goes to show all the fluctuations through the week. And it's really actually interesting. And I, I spoke to you, Pascal, saying how I've, we recently 
filmed a podcast with, I had a consultation and then I filmed a podcast with Broderick Chavez talking about kind of the scale, how useful it is as a marker of progress. And he was basically saying how like, I'm investing too much into the scale. Um, even though we talk about how unimportant the scale is, how we try not to invest too much into the scale, I was still investing too much into it. Um, and it, he talked about how he actually only gets people to weigh in once a week. And I was like, that's completely against everything I've ever heard before. Um, and like Absolutely. against how a lot of kind of, we do it as like our niche, like you take a daily weigh in and then you take an average to work out the fluctuations. And he was like, yeah, that's one way of getting rid of those fluctuations. Or you could just weigh in once per week under the same conditions every week. And that gets rid of kind of the noise. And I was and I was very suspicious and like this didn't sit necessarily well with me. I was like, what well, things could change. He was like, yeah, but if you just keep that one way in the exact same every week, you don't get the conscious weighing in every morning of seeing the scale going up, down, up, down, like and it playing with your emotions and you can focus on just getting the job done. And I, I, I then after I spoke to him about it and Pascal, when you listen to the podcast, you'll probably understand more oh, really? when, whenever, <laughs> whenever else. I have, right, I've, it runs through my head right now. And it, it currently doesn't, it doesn't really make sense because, I mean, theoretically, so many things can lead up to that uh, way and that will have an influence and impact on the reading itself. So it, it isn't really only about the circumstances right before the way in. Uh, but more so the days leading into it. But um, yeah, perhaps I need to listen to it to yeah, I get think a it, I better think understanding. It really becomes quite clear and when that podcast gets released. It's, it's, you can see me, I go back and forth with him. I kind of challenge him on it. But he, he almost does convince me that that might be something that I would use in future with clients, like weighing in less frequently and like, especially when massing, like weighing in every two weeks I mean, or weighing in once a month. Like that is something that actually... To me, it allows people to trust, it forces trust in the process because you don't yeah. get that constant feedback. And you're I looking mean, at more important indicators, like your physique, how's your physique looking? How's your daily kind of images changing? Things like this. So sorry to interrupt you there. Um, didn't want to interrupt your flow here. Um, but yeah, I mean, I feel the same way about it, especially throughout that contest prep um, my contest prep, your contest prep, and also what I see with all of my clients or with many of my clients at least, uh, that the scale, I, I go more and more away from it. And also I'm now actually transitioning over to kind of a slightly gaining phase and I haven't um, weighed myself since I stopped the cut. I did it in the in the first few days and then I realized that especially in the first few days it is absolutely bollocks to do so yeah. and now um, I'm and now I'm on my overreaching week I have a pulled muscle uh, on my back and I'm taking ibuprofen like 1800 milligrams not because of the pain but more so because of the inflammation on my back but I hold a lot of water and the weight fluctuations throughout that that time doesn't really give you any clear indicator of if you are gaining quickly enough or too slow. And what basically what I'm I'm doing right now is simply take a look at my physique yeah. and my vascularity. Like, okay, do I have the feeling that my vascularity is kind of disappearing slowly and my abs aren't really showing that much anymore? And the basic thing is because I just want to mention that so many people judge it upon their abs. But for me personally, how my abs are structured and built and how I'm holding fluff, that isn't the best indicator to see if I'm gaining weight or not. For me personally, it's, it's more about, yeah, I have a couple of wanes throughout my body, which I track kind of. Yeah. Like I, I take a look at the veins on my, on my quads, for example. Um, and here on my, on my chest, there are like two to three. Same goes for uh, arm veins. Yeah? When I see them slightly disappear, I then know, okay, I'm gaining, but it's, it's more of a judgmental thing like, okay, I take a look from week to week, compare with each other and make a ju judgment upon that. Yeah. And 
you really need to get away from that emotional state and really try to be objective about it because you can easily fall into the trap of feeling just fluffy at all um, simply because you're eating more right and this just screws with your head but i think this is a to get back on the on the topic now again i think that this is a way better indicator to actually take the scale and same as you i'm moving more and more away from the scale because it's a tool it's a good tool to have in your toolbox and to make use of, especially in a cutting phase, but more so in predicted times and in times which it's not really extreme, mm-hmm. right? I think I, I, I completely agree. And I think having, I think because we place like, okay, when you're bulking, you should gain at this rate. When you're cutting, you should lose at this rate. And so we very much pin all of it on the scale, but it's like, well, actually, when you're bulking, you should be looking at your physique and how it's changing mm. because you could, like we could tell you to gain at this rate or gain at this rate. That could be too fast or too slow for you. You might oh. somehow have come across a training method that is giving you great gains or somehow you're not and it's really not really working. And you're, But you're no. focusing on the scale and you're like, oh, the scale's doing this, so that means things are going well. Same with fat loss. Like if you, like you might be following the scale and it might be going in the right direction but you might be losing too fast too slow and you can see that more clearly in your physique and i think by having daily weigh-ins because they're daily it makes us put too like a lot of emphasis on the scale Uh even though we're like oh yeah it's one tool in the toolbox but because you use that tool every single day you're constantly focusing on it whereas if you were to say take images and scale weight once per week they're like almost equal value then in your eyes because it's like they're just there. Um, so yeah, it's, it's super it's interesting. Just so, just on that note, uh, just a quick one right now because it's funny that you've mentioned that you're focusing too much on, on the number itself. And this was something I was actually falling into with the contour spread because I didn't really see my scale weight moving for such a long time. Then it dropped, then I needed to pull the plug. Now I transitioned over. I looked at the scale weight and my weight just skyrocketed like really skyrocketed and i was just like what the fuck is happening right now and then i did the math (laughs) because i mean you you need to remind yourself that there's no way you're actually gaining that much of fluff in the first days unless you're really coming out of a contest prep where this is actually physiologically possible, but, but I wasn't that lead. And I was just, in the first days, I was just taking a look at the scale and it stressed the shit out of me. And basically, all it did was gave me anxiety, but no clear readings and idea of what's really going on. Mm-hmm. So I just wanted to to give another example for it, so that the people out there, yeah, know how it actually uh, can look like. Yeah, I mean, I've had it with clients before, and we've said it. It's like, well, if if you didn't know what the scale had said this week, would you have thought that you've made progress? And it was like, yeah, everything else is saying you've made progress. So it's like, yeah. well then it doesn't really matter what the scale says because there are lots of things that can impact your scale weight. And I, I know uh, this this uh, analogy comes up with Broderick and I told it, I went through it with you and I was like, you make a peanut butter sandwich. You got this slice of bread here, slice of bread here. You put jam on this slice, you put peanut butter on this slice, put it together, then you put it on a scale and you ask, so how much jam and how much peanut butter you got there? And it's like, I don't know. I've just got like a 500 gram sandwich. <laughs> but how much how much peanut butter and how much jam is there? It's like, I don't have a clue. Like this sandwich weighs for 500 grams. It's like, well, you've got a human body here. You're putting it on a scale. You don't know how much fat and muscles there. You've just got this this body that you're weighing as a totality. And when it's a physique sport like bodybuilding, it doesn't matter like actually how much fat you've got it's how you appear how much fat you appear to have and this is i guess this could be part of the genetic factor and like some people can hold fat more favorably in that they look leaner than they are which is really cool like if that was a thing like if you could look five percent body fat and be ten percent like fuck that's awesome um but that could happen like little things like that so um that's definitely something i took away from broderick hey and it's so funny because when you go on like old broish bodybuilding forums take a look at 
like people who aren't really into macro tracking or stuff like that. Like, and ask them, like, how quickly should I gain in a gaining phase? They say, okay, eat and go buy your looks. Eat like 500 calories in a surplus. When you're gaining too quickly, pull it back a little bit. If you don't make that progress visually, you are aiming for or striving for, eat more. Uh, uh, it's it's Simple, the broish right? ment- yeah it's the broish mentality again which got lost over the years and which is kind of un- becoming unsexy like I was thinking actually of a topic for a blog post like is being a bro dad and it, it just raises the question like the methodologies and ideas of some of the bros out there aren't really bad at all and I think that um, with there are a couple of my clients to whom I'm saying that even that the the bros are actually really rigid or disciplined when it comes to nutrition, for example, and you can question the methodologies behind it if that's actually the best thing to do. But if that allows them to stick to a diet and make progress, is that really bad? And when you compare that with something like if it fits your macros and people start overeating and can't really stick to a diet because they got too much flexibility and variety out there because they know they could potentially fit it into their macros, but because they can make the decisions and they aren't able to make the, the right decisions on that behalf, perhaps an old bodybuilding bro approach is the right one then. Right. And uh, it's funny that, yeah, though, those broish mentalities, actually, there's something to it. And I think that this is something we need to keep in mind, especially the, the quote unquote science based uh, or oriented athletes out there who only stick to the numbers and data. I completely agree. I think there's becoming a, um, a growth of athletes or people who are very much like PubMed and number warriors. Like they go off these as if they're gold, but Mm -hmm. all of us know fat loss, muscle gain, all of these things, they're not really linear processes. And a lot of the time, and I think I certainly do it for myself. Sometimes like I'll focus so much on, oh, how many many calories am I eating? Um, What's the weight, like my scale weight doing? And not like just embrace the process. How much, mm-hmm. how freeing and enjoyable is just knowing that you're eating more than you need to eat. Just know, like you, I think uh-huh. most of us know how to do that, and then just chucking training and like having a. I think, I think actually having structured training is like really, really great. I think to a degree, having structure, too much structure in your like nutritional what you're doing with your nutrition, like what you're doing with your nutrition really shouldn't need to change that often unless you've got a really adaptive metabolism. Otherwise, like a lot of it is just, it it almost feels like wasted time really focusing on the scale all the time. But yeah, I mean, that's, that's, it's, it's something that's definitely interesting to us. I think it's something that we have our ways of coaching. And I think a lot of people have that kind of daily way and method of coaching and, Maybe it's something that works with some clients and maybe it's something we don't use with other clients. And I'm excited for the fact that Broderick seriously challenged my methodologies as a coach, which is exciting because I really thought that was something I had nailed. And it definitely works, but I think there's some cases in which it might be better not to use it, um, which is what we always do. We're always changing our, well, updating rather, not changing, updating our approaches, taking methods from different coaches, learning from who we consider to be the best um, and taking what we think will work best for our clients. And I'm so proud of the fact that we do that and we aren't dogmatic um, because, yeah, we could just say, oh, no, screw that. That sounds stupid weighing in once per week or once a month. Like the scale is a very important tool. It's like, well, actually, maybe not always. So... Um, yeah, and it's it's. I, I can remember Cliff Wilson saying something similar, like he's actually taking really care of his clients and watching every single bit what happens throughout the way. Yeah, and 
basically what he's saying is that he rather only wants to have check-ins in a video format than any filled out spreadsheet whatsoever. I'd be the same. Yeah, totally. And this is actually what's coaching about. It's not about the numbers. On sheet, everything can look perfect. But it's something completely else to hear the other person talking or to look them in the face and perhaps just take a recomposition, for example. Yeah. On the on the on the numbers itself, it looks like as if nothing's happening whatsoever. But it could be that there's a massive change going on in their appearance as well. And um, same holds true with retaining muscle mass, losing muscle mass, gaining muscle mass, all that kind of stuff, losing fat. And I think that um, the more and the longer I coach, the more I come to realize that the numbers are only like a, a nice to have. But yes. um, I'm, I'm trying to get more and more away from being over analytical when it comes to the numbers itself. I did it in the past because I was always interested in numbers and I was always like that. Well, I am still that structured guy who likes everything, having written out and having as much data as possible. And I'm not saying that this is bad in any kind of way because I'm definitely in the opinion that the more data you have, the more you can actually Great. predict things. But uh, also, when it comes to the importance of it, I think then we need to decipher what's actually really important and what's less important, but more so a nice to have data, yeah. right? I completely agree. And you just think back to like, when you first got into lifting, like when I first did my first bulk, like I saw great gains, like maybe yeah. I didn't do it the best way possible and probably having some data would have really helped me and like having some knowledge of what is a reasonable amount of weight to gain over like a couple oh, yeah. of like weeks. But I still <laughs> made that. amazing gains. And then my first cut, I had no idea. Like I just cut and it, it worked. And it's like, well, you can still do these things without all this data. I just think, like you said, it's a real nice to have and it's something very useful to, to track things, but it's not the be all and end all. Um, so yeah, that's something I've definitely learned this time round. Um, but yeah, to get back on like how I'm doing, I think I've just taken my posing video this morning, um, which I'm gonna, uh, I'm really frustrating. My internet's really slow. So I've got like so many videos I need to upload. And I really wanna upload this posing one because I want Pascal to have a look over it, to be honest, um, to see how I'm looking. But I think I'm, re I'm feeling like I messaged Pascal the other day saying like, I feel super confident. Like my physique, everything's coming in. Like my legs basically was what I was waiting for. Um, mm. I don't think this lighting actually does any favors to my back because I recently posted up a back shot in the gym where there was good overhead lighting and it's looking insane. So like the leanness is there, which is really exciting. So that's all very exciting. Um, things are in a good way. My macros are exactly the same. Haven't changed anything there. Cardio is the same. Um, I will probably be slightly increasing cardio next week just to get over any adaptions that have taken place just by a small titch, uh, mm. titch, a uh, small amount, <laughs> um, probably by about 10% overall for the week. So nothing crazy. Uh, uh, but otherwise, everything's staying the same. My meals, I'm very structured. You'll see I've got a full day of eating coming out um, when Pascal's managed to get all of that put together because it is it is. My full day of eating, because I train twice a day, it's kind of like, it's not just like, this is meal one, this is meal two, this is meal three. It's like, this is my more like pre-workout, this is my post-workout, this is my intra-workout. It's quite uh, complex. So you can look forward to that. Um, a lot of people yeah, have been asking cool. for the recipes and stuff. I'm like, it'll come out. <laughs> uh, the, the funny thing is that Steve asked me before he recorded that full day of eating, if I could actually edit it, if that would be all right for me. Sure thing. That's not a big deal, right? I mean, and then I received all the the files, which is like over twenty two minutes of only eating and and talking about food, like stitching that together, editing that, additionally to other files. Oh man, I it takes I think, ages, ages. I think it'll be all right. If I think it'll, they'd literally look okay if you just stitch them together. But yeah, yeah I think yeah. you're gonna make some magic happen on that, um, which I'm actually really excited for. I think it's gonna be really like a cool video but also informative hopefully um Pascal yeah. will tell me if it was not <laughs> no no I, I think that's really interesting for the people out there to see how a day might look like especially 
full training twice a day, which is also interesting for the people out there because we are receiving a lot of questions when it comes to training twice daily, um, which is sorry for for saying it like that for many people really not the best idea uh, to do or even consider just unnecessary um, yeah it's without going really into detail i think we can save it for another time or even make make a blog post about it um Why like one yeah but i mean really the downsides to it and for who it actually is the best and why not for some uh, particular folks yeah. or something. Uh, anyway, without going too much into that, I think it's really interesting to see what you're actually eating, the structure behind it, um, also the the thoughts behind it, because you aren't eating just out of pleasure or just out of hunger, but more so to actually fuel the second workout. And I could imagine that uh, I'm training twice daily myself right now, and I could definitely throw in a meal that would satisfy me more between the first and the second workout but it's basically it's it's only about actually getting in um yeah carbohydrates some proteins to fuel up your glycogen stores as quickly as possible and it's not just about yeah satisfying me but more so just serving its purpose yeah and i um, think this is also helped in a weird way, it's helped me be less food focused because Should it's be, kind yeah. of like, I have to have this meal to yeah. fuel my training properly. And that training is going to be better because, well, it's better for sustaining muscle mass I, and things like this. So I think Mike said it in, in one of his videos. I, I think the, the cool video about him where he talks about him and his past and uh, his desires and all that kind of stuff, eight minutes long, go and yeah. check it out, guys. It's a really cool video and where he basically says at one point that nutrition is now at a point where it's not about enjoying the food anymore. It's not about satiation or uh, anything like that. It is only there for one purpose and that purpose is performance yeah. and enhance your overall athleticism. And I definitely have some meals like that and then I have other meals where it's satisfies my hunger and <laughs> for the sure most part. and this is what happens in at the end of the day for me just something i like and i also am kind of feeling more full um and yeah but basically um one thing i wanted to talk about um was that we we touched up on slightly the last time when we talked with luke about planning and everything like setting yourself up for a successful contest prep and yeah. i think that this is one thing you've done just did such a great job on this time and i mean all the planning all the off season led to this point now where you can say that your uh, your preparation is going so well and that you're feeling so well and i know yesterday you went out to the cinema and it's funny because uh, right before we started that podcast here you just said to me that it is so weird because you're feeling so fantastic you were kind of literally dancing in the corner and this is only something that happens when you are actually gaining yeah um and yeah, I, I just wanted to point that out once again that all the planning you did in the past and, and the, the entire off season, everything led to that point now and you are now reaping the re rewards for it. And I can't see that it gets any worse because you are already at a really good and lean stage and it's all about just shedding off that last single bit then going into your peak week and now comes to the point where I want to talk with you about the next upcoming weeks how are they going to look like so yeah actually just wanted to touch on yesterday um, so yeah I went out for, with my sister and we actually went to called God's Junkyard so it was like cool you probably saw or people <laughs> on Instagram would have seen it. it was like cool loads of lights so yeah went there um, I just had a Costa, I had a protein bar, and then went over and we went to Leicester Square. I picked up some cottage cheese, sugar snaps, tomatoes, <laughs> and some skinny popcorn. 
the um, usual things for the cinema to snack on in the cinema and then yeah just saw the film and then when i was walking home i decided to yeah t- well take a long like take a stop off early walk an extra couple of thousand so i got to like eighteen thousand steps by the end of the day and was like yeah literally like dancing along the street to listen to music and it was just fantastic so no that was really good um so yeah the next in terms of planning for the next few weeks um so i'm coming to this next week is basically my least like stressful week in terms of like Mm. planned and like it's just another week whereas the next week after that i'm going to be looking at what my water intake is on average per day so really tracking it every day and making sure I kind of have a rough average so that in the last two weeks, I know kind of where I want my water intake and sodium intake to be. Um, and then also in terms of carbohydrates, they start to be manipulated within those two weeks as well. Um, so it, it's quite nice. My fourth week of training, which is my overreaching week, is my depletion week as well. So that's when I'm going to be depleting. Um, I may throw in some extra workouts, um, just full body depletion on top of my overreaching training, just to make sure everything is like, I talked about this in a consult with Broderick. He was like, you have to deplete every muscle group. Like you have to train every muscle group and deplete them of glycogen. Otherwise they don't like super compensate. Mm. Um, you can deplete total body glycogen, but if you don't like train a muscle group, like your rear delts, they won't then absorb it. So they become like, sorry, you're going to say. So going for pump work. Yeah. Pump work essentially. So it's going to be traditional hypertrophy, high volume training. And then I'm going to chuck in some like light pump work to get rid of like just everything. Um, and then in the second week is a a deload. So the next week would be my deload week anyway. It's it's a light training, um, just to kind of keep active, lots of posing practice that week, um, kind of cardio will be tapered down and yeah, kind of glycogen replenishment in that final week kind of with a, I'll be nicely depleted. So my bucket will be nice and empty and then I'll be filling up and then kind of holding on to it and like tapering carbs down into the show day. Mm. And then the, what we talked about or what I talked about with Broderick is basically on the show day, you're basically like a perfect canvas, like you're a done piece of art. There should be nothing done on show day. So it's literally, you've done the hard work. All you're doing is sipping on water, having small amounts of protein, small amounts of carbs. And on that day, you should just look great. And there's nothing crazy you need to do apart from the short term, sodium uh, before stage which i really like that approach it's nothing i've tried with clients before it's something i'm trying for the first time um so the next this actually today i'm hoping to plan that i'm going to go through it with pascal i'm going to go through it with broderick um and just make sure that it all makes sense um it's very much it's not crazy it is just some depletion and some super compensation of glycogen water and sodium um and it should bring about my best package but i said Mm. to pascal the other day like if i looked on stage like i did the other day when i was very confident in my physique i'll be super proud um i planned i've already got my tan booked so i've got my tan the night before and then you get topped up on the day so that's all good because i'm pacey as hell Um, (laughs) i've already said i've shaved armpits chest everything um to try and kind of make sure i'm kind of not really sensitive to it so i'm going like too many ingrown hairs that sort of thing and i don't miss any areas because there's so much fucking hair everywhere um <laughs> and otherwise i think that's pretty much everything i mean the thing i'm I, I will say i'm anxious about is well one trying this thing for the first time so i've never done this sort of kind of approach i've always done the traditional kind of 3dmj more so approach where it's a bit of a front mm-hmm. load on the thursday then you kind of taper or wednesday wednesday thursday then taper carbs down into the saturday and then on the saturday you're just kind of like eating some like depends on how you look that morning how much more carbs and stuff you need um this is more of a just more going on and you are doing stuff with sodium and water that you Oh, you wouldn't traditionally do in the 3 dmj approach um, see how it works for me i've not tried on clients because i've not tried it myself i want to try it myself first um this is my practice show i don't think any peaking protocol unless it's, it's extreme can ruin a physique i think it has to be an ex- like you have to do something quite wacky in your peak week protocol 
to ruin a very lean physique. So I'm going to go in looking great. It's just kind of those final touches. So I'm excited for that. So that's going to be hopefully a yeah, planned t today. That's going to be my to-do list today because that's what I want to nail down. Um, cool. No, but um, what's what's the time? We are 40 minutes. 40 minutes. Perfect. So it sounds good. good. Steve, uh, talk about uh, the, the, the scale weight again, like forever. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it is excited. And I think that the next weeks will anyway be all about you. I think um, we don't need to cover much about me here in the next yeah. following weeks. So uh, I think that we will um, leave it there. I think, um, yeah. I don't think we have anything else to throw out or share. Do no. We? No. I mean, basically, again, because it feels like forever, uh, I just want to make aware of people reviewing, rating the podcast over at iTunes, giving it a thumbs up here at YouTube, uh, subscribe to the channel, helps us massively. Um, if you have any questions for us, yeah, you can always put it into the comment section below or head over to Facebook, write us a private message at our page or apply or request to our private Facebook group there. Or is it private? Is it, is it, it is a closed one. You need to request, uh, yeah. send a request um, to the revisestronger.com Facebook group, in which all of uh, our followers, or most of them at least are. And if you have any questions for other podcast episodes as well, or such as a Q, exactly, uh, such as a Q and A of my guest hotel, you can always throw questions in there as well. But other than that, I mean, it is summertime. Um, people will probably listen to this episode uh, while they're doing their cardio outside or when they are on holiday. So uh, I think that's about it, and we will leave you to it and yeah, enjoy we'll it. Yeah, totally. cheers, guys. Cheers, huh?